welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Hello, and welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast. Today, I am joined by Jeff Daly. He is a writer, artist, cartoonist, director, animator, producer, paper engineer, lecturer, and competitive duck herder. That last one's a joke. In addition to those pursuits, Jeff gives back to his local community. He was a study buddy at Longfellow Elementary for 35 years and gives talks at schools about writing and drawing. But I mostly know him as my best friend's father and a wonderful, humorous, talented human whom I'm grateful to have known for many years and very glad to uh, get you on the show today. Well, it's it's nice to be here. And it's been a while since I've seen you. <laughs> it is. It's been a hot minute, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that what the kids say nowadays? Okay. I, I think so. I think so. <laughs> so we're going to start with some heavy hitting questions, one of which is who or what inspired you to become an artist? Uh, well, let's see, inspired, it was just everything going on at the media at the time. And since I'm older now, a lot of people won't know these, but they will know Charles Schultz with Peanuts. That was the number one. But the comic strips were great. You had BC by Johnny Hart. And you had Pogo by Walt Kelly. I was going to say Cats and Jammer Kids, but that's it, a joke because that's about uh, 50 years old. I'm not that old on the thing. But, uh, but you also had the cartoons, the Warner Brothers cartoons that were crazy and uh, Disney, of course. And then there were the comics. And I was a big comic book fan. So you had Marvel and uh, DC. It is funny to see all the Marvel movies come out and go, yeah, I had those comics about 40 years ago. <laughs> and then now they're making movies of them. So uh, so that's uh, that was really kind of just being inspired by everything that I saw in cartooning. But really, it was who inspired me is probably more important. And first, it started with my mom. And my mom knew I loved to draw. She always got me crayons and paper and stuff like that to, you know, kind of keep me busy and stuff. And I remember uh, uh, one time I was, it was, I was probably about fifth grade and uh, I was trying to draw a gun and I couldn't get it right. I go to mom and I go, could you, I can't get this right. Can you draw me a gun? And she goes, well, I don't. I don't know how to draw. I said, well, that's no, just a gun. I mean, just uh, let's see if I'm even close up like that. So, so she draws the gun and I look at it and I go, you call this a gun? This isn't a gun. And, and I looked up and she was just crushed. I mean, I could see in her face and I went, oh, I mean, no, it's not, it's not a bad gun. I mean, you know, most guns have triggers, but no, that was, that was a good try. And I thought, you know, even at a young kid that age, you know, it doesn't hurt to be a little complimentary and encouraging at times, especially if it's your mom. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was one that, my mom has always been one. She does floral, floral arrangements. She has done uh, uh, the screens over in Japan, painted screens in Japan. She she designed our house, one of our houses. So you're going, you don't have to be an artist or you don't have to artists know how to draw. I mean, it's just, it's so many things that are involved in creativity. So she was one. And my dad was a, uh, a vice president at uh, General Motors and uh, he put up with my foolishness, but he liked to build things. And so I just remember we used to put uh, Charlie Brown characters out on our front lawn for Christmas. And he would he would cut them out of plywood. We, they were life-size things out of plywood. And I would paint them. And then he would animate them by using like grill motors so that the characters would move and there'd be like a jack in the box come out, you know, and stuff like that, you know, and you just take that for granted that, oh, you know, every father must do this, but, <laughs> but he lived to regret it because uh, what happens when you're in Michigan, it's about 10 below most of the time. So the grill motors would freeze up and late at night, kids would come to our house and go, Mr. Daly, your, your things aren't moving. And so he'd be go out and doing, he goes, you know, let's any other characters we make now, they don't move. 
I mean, let's just, you know, let's just call that off on it. So, so it was one that he also supported me through the years. And it was just that kind of thing. And I can't count from that point on of how many people have helped me and supported me, including my wife, Jan, but friends, strangers that you work with and stuff like that. I mean, it's just, it really helps you as a creative person to just kind of move forward. It does. It's wonderful that you had that inspiration and that support at a young age. And took it for granted. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> no, I know. I was a kid. Give me you a break. You were a kid, of course, a of course. <laughs> at one point in life, did you realize that there was no turning back? Like you absolutely had to keep going in this creative path that you were doing? You know, and I've I've talked to other cartoons and stuff like that. I don't think you have a point where you go, there's no going back. It's just like, that's just what you do. I mean, you're just, you're just doing it and kind of uh, trying to figure out that you like doing it. And so you kind of go through and I found in, in high school that other kids are not, or they're doing more math, stuff like that. And I remember we had a class where he said, what would you like to do, you know, when you grow up? And I, I went, well, I haven't really thought about it, but, I, you know, I like drawing cartoons, maybe cartoonists. And it was basically like, yeah, well, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if, like I said, turning back just didn't seem to be an option. I mean, just really never thought about it. You just, once again, taken for granted and then just fell into things. You know, it's just kind of like opportunities came up and I just kind of fell into it. Yeah. And you ended up, when I knew you, you were working at Hallmark. How did that yeah. come to be? Well, let's see, Hallmark. Yeah, why did I go to Hallmark? No, that's, I mean, you talk about where you have a certain path. Well, I was in the college and my roommate was, you know, we're coming up a senior year. My roommate was in hotel and restaurant management. And that's, you know, that's like a real job, like a real grown-up job. And he was going and interviewing with all these firms, stuff like that. And he would come back. And at that time, when I was in college, I started doing some of the editorial cartoons. Another one where my roommate had said, well, you know, there's a cartoonist. They're looking for one. That was about my second year of college. And he goes, why don't you go? And I was like, well, you know, what would it hurt? So I kind of went and, you know, wow, I was making two bucks for a small panel cartoon and for the full size, five bucks. I mean, I thought, well, geez, I'm going to be rolling in dough. This is, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was one like, am I going to do all this work for that? And I thought, well, you know, it just is kind of interesting, you know, to get into. And the funny thing is the Michigan State, I went to Michigan State University. Another thing where schools, I was thinking about whether I was going to go into an art school and there was something neat about Michigan State. They had a good art school, but they had so many other things going on that you could get into. And you met such a diverse group and stuff like that. It was really fun, you know, of what was uh, going on at the uh, at the school. I also mentioned things like the science nerds would go out. And I remember one time they were out in our, our area and they made a hot air balloon out of garbage bags. They kind of melded them all together. And then what did they do? They went and got a flamethrower. Oh. Now, now, how do you get a flamethrower? I, you know, I have no idea, but you're going, this may not end up well. And it was one, fortunately, it was one that they put it into the balloon. I remember it taking off and they threw somebody in it, but they were all going, no, no, he's going to, you know, and he crashed into the side of the building. And I thought, you know, what a great environment to be in, you know, and just things that are happening and going on. So back to the cartooning, I was doing cartooning at the, at the time and he goes, uh, well, what are you going to do for a job? job and I go well I was thinking maybe editorial cartooning I don't know if it's design and he goes well you know Hallmark's coming and I go okay and he goes no you know why don't you go he was tired of me sitting around after doing cartoons and sitting in early in the morning while he's interviewing and so I said yeah that's what I my that's been my dream I want to be a greeting card artist. That's what I've been working my life for. It's just get out of here. And so then I thought about it. I thought, well, it doesn't hurt to find out. You know, that's it, kind of, I think, the life of any creative person. You have to be just open to different things. And so so I went in and interviewed. And uh, uh, But before I went, I went to a Hallmark store. 
and had not been in a green card store. I mean, I drew and I did cartoons. So for Jan, I would draw cards and, you know, for Ren, stuff like that. But I thought, well, I'll go and see what Hallmark does. And that's when I tell students, when they're looking for a job of any kind, find out about the company that you're 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 going for. I mean, learn about them and find out how maybe you can fit in or how you can help them. And people don't realize, you know, they go, oh, I'm just going to do this great portfolio and stuff like that. It's like, well, how do you, how can you help them, you know, to, to make them money? And, and they notice that. I mean, I really think, uh, so I went into uh, the recruiting, sent my portfolio in and I'd written a few ideas. I drew up designs and stuff of the cartoon character. I thought, well, I'll do ideas so they look like greeting cards. And I sold them three ideas on my portfolio. So that that was encouraging. I mean, it was like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. So I fly down to Kansas City and I'm interviewing and they go, uh, well, let's see, uh, you know, we really like your stuff and and we're going to hire you. And I said, good. And they said, you're going to be a writer. And I went, what? wait, what? And they go, a writer. I'm going, I don't think you've seen my portfolio. I think <laughs> I think it's it's really you know the and they uh, Bob McCloskey who was the uh, boss at the time he says I tell you what he said you know we have just lots of artists but we need writers and writers are hard to get and he says if you make it as a writer you're going to have a job here for a while and so it's like oh well okay <laughs> and so that's when I started. Which kind of brings up, I wanted to get into, too, you, you talk about opportunities that hit you and you just take it. We never really talked about your trip out to, I don't, and I don't know if you've talked about it on your podcast, about your, your group going out to the Imaginations, the Imagineers. Oh, yeah. What was your reaction to that when Lauren asked you to join the group? Were you just like, oh, yeah, or was like, what? <laughs> I mean, what what was it? Yeah, I well, I had never... I hadn't really heard about it before. Um, and I was like, wait, you're you're entering this international competition and, and you need me? <laughs> I was like, what do you what do you need See, me for? <laughs> except you're in the Hallmark thing, not on the radar, and you're going, okay, so but the thing is, obviously you went, well, who else? I think it was also Hannah and Justin were yeah. in it, stuff like that. So you kind of knew the people and you knew they were good. But I and I have always found that at, at work, too, when we'd ask people to join the group and you'd name some of the people, the really good people in the group, they go, well, I shouldn't I, I don't belong in there. And you go, then you're in it, because when you <laughs> say that, that's the person we want. So so kind of from there, how to how did you go about I mean, how did you get together and on the project and stuff? At, at the time, I was in grad school number one uh, at UMKC. Okay. And I was right. They wanted me to write music for their ride. And I was like, okay, well that I, that I can do. But I had this like really old laptop <laughs> and it was like chugging along and I was doing the best I can. And the first, and I had completed something and Hannah and Lauren came and listened to it. And they're like, yeah, that's nice, but that's not what we want. I'm like, oh, so it was interesting because they, they're like, okay, here's some parameters. And then, and then I worked on it and it was the first time I had to create something with someone else's project in mind it, I couldn't just sort of free spiritedly do something yeah. but it was good for me and we ended up being part of the I think it was 10 or 11 uh groups that were flown out as finalists in this international competition and it was just it was life-changing it was life-changing I came back and I dropped out of grad school <laughs> because I was like this is not the path I want to be on and I need to find myself and it was because of the passion and love for what people do that I saw at Disney, you know, I was yep. like, I got to find that. I got to find that passion in my life, you know? Exactly. And, and the thing is I got a phone call from Lauren while that was going on. And she goes, dad, you know what? I found my people, which is the best call you can get as a parent. You know, it was just, it's all she had to say. I was doing it. I wanted to tell you because I've done, I did an independent animated film just to keep my sanity while I was at work at Hallmark. So I'm on the other side of that from you because I'm just going in and I'm thinking, how am I going to get music? You know, how, you know, where do I go? You, you get into the nuts and bolts of the thing. And I remember I was talking to, uh, I just started corresponding. The other thing of just where Frizz Freeling, who was one of the animators for Warner Brothers, and Chuck Jones and a few others, and I sent letters off, said, I'm kind of working on a film. I, I love your stuff, which is they weren't getting the attention at that time, which was sad because you're going, they were just the best. 
and it was just kind of a one of just saying, I just love your stuff. Just wanted to say that was it. And he started corresponding with me and you're going, what? And, and he was going, really? He says, you know what? Don't talk about it. Just do it. He says, get in. And one of the things he told me was, he says, find some music to what goes to your scene. Just any music, find the music that you like and then put it in because it gives the feel of animation. You know, it's like it it kind of gives you and I thought that's interesting. So so I did it and I had like a one of the little boy flying and stuff like that. And and so I was using Dave Grusin. And I don't know if you've heard of Dave Grusin at that time. He was doing a lot of the movies and stuff like that. Just jazz. Very, very sweet stuff. And I thought, why? Well, you know, I. I probably can't use this, but I thought, you know, I went to the publisher, I went to the Dave Grusin people actually first, you get into the business side, but the Dave Grusin people, but they love the cartoon and they said, you have to talk to the business side. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> so it was one where I found out uh, it was going to be about $10,000 a song to put in it you know I had a few songs I thought you know I'm no math whiz but <laughs> I'm thinking yeah this is not gonna work and so I thought well I'm I'm gonna have to do have somebody do and so I was talking around to my friend uh, David Albright who had done the sound with it. he goes oh I know a guy in town that does music and he says it's Greg Mackinder you know you might want to talk to him and so we talked a little bit about the film I said I will pay you a little bit just to kind of you know, see how this works. And and I thought I didn't want to play the Dave Grusin music because I didn't want him to be influenced. I just wanted to see what he would do. And so sure enough, where you were talking about, it, he came, came to me with the song. And the first one was, it was something about where he was running or whatever. And he, he played it and it seemed just a little mechanical. It was kind of like, you know, it seemed like it was just on beat rather than and I, I was just like, it was going through my head. You're sitting there smiling, but I was thinking, how do I tell him? I don't, I don't think this works, you know? And, and I go, I don't even know how to tell him, you know, what? And so he played that and I was like, oh, you know, hey, uh, hey mom, nice gun. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, oh, okay, that was interesting. He goes, well, let me play the next one of where the kid was flying. Oh my God. It was, it was just beautiful. It, it was like, it was everything about you going, oh man, he just really, I wanted to jump up and hug him and kiss him. I mean, it was just like, that was great. But what was neat about that is that then I could tell him how I like that and what I thought was missing. And I could be wrong about the other one that he had played. And he goes, well, I was just trying something different with kids toys and stuff like that. Well, he came back with it. And I tell you, uh, it went to film festivals, stuff like that. The best compliments I got, they go, we love the music. And it was just very cool to, I mean, it was cool to go out there for the film festival, but Greg and his wife came out and Greg was making no money at the time and just went out there. But it was so cool. I think we only had 20 people in the, in the, the uh, theater. But I mean, his wife was just almost crying and you could see how excited. And I felt the same way. When the crowd cheered of only 20 people sounded like, you know, an amazing, amazing crowd. So that's when I started to realize in, in collaboration, okay, you have to give a little bit, you know, and it's like, even can I change it, you know, to help you out and stuff. So when, I wanted to ask you about that because it was one that I thought it it's exactly what I thought it would be. When you got the opportunity, you didn't go, yeah, yo, you bet. Are you kidding? I'm great. Let's go out. We'll show them at Disney. It's just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and I have found that with professionals everywhere. I've talked to directors and animators, stuff like that, to where they ask a director, they go to them, they go, well, we, we want you to direct a film. Have you directed a film? They go, oh, yeah. Yeah, I've directed a film. They go, they went straight to the library and found out how do you direct a film? You know, and I think that that's, that hasn't changed. We at least have Google now. So if you're asked to do something, you can kind of, kind of get in and, and see what, uh, you, you know, just get a sense of what's going on. But I was just so happy for you guys because uh, being at Hallmark, we had just the most passionate, fun group. And it's like they're in Kansas City. You don't even think about, you know, what are they all doing in Kansas City? And I remember Lauren going out. She said, one of the people said at the, at the, uh, at the meeting, you guys had 
they were from what? They were from Spain. I mean, it was international that mm -hmm. you had Spain and the top colleges. And Lauren, one of the guys said to him, you guys are from Kansas City? And she goes, hey, Walt Disney started in Kansas City, buster. <laughs> <laughs> So did you, you guys pretty much had it. You really had most of the stuff together then when you got out there, it was just kind of working with the people and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was so great. It was a whirlwind, I think like 10 days or something. And we went out and we got to work with each other and sort of see everyone else's projects and, you know, get mentored and, and yeah. go behind the scenes. And it was just, it was really, it was uh, no pun intended here, just magical, just really yeah. magical. No, I know exactly what you mean. And and it's hard to describe to people when you're there. I, I remember uh, Cheryl Augustine, one of our writers, she goes, she worked in an office for the one time she goes, you don't know how brilliant the people are here in this, in this building. So you just take it for granted that, you know, they just, uh, although, you know, had the problems at Hallmark too, when, when it was like, when I hit the wall at that, you hit those. So, uh, so yeah, even when it's really good, it can be sometimes terrifying <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. or you don't know where you're at because yeah. uh, I think uh, uh, the one thing at Hallmark was is how big it well and that's where, where Disney is too it's how big it is so when I first started at Hallmark I thought uh, it was overwhelming I mean it's just like I have no idea where I fit in and you know there's so many and there's so many good people and stuff like that and I get into the thing too is when you're in you found the people that helped you out when I was in my job I was able to find the people I just lucked out there were a few people that were there that basically saved my job because when I first started at Hallmark uh I, I it was just kind of like I they put me they were starting up a humor department but what the humor department was at that time was contemporary. Contemporary was the nuts that did the small, tall cards. We called them liquor store cards. That, uh, But they kept all of them off in a warehouse building separate from everybody else. Because when I, when I recruited there too, they go, oh, you know, those people in contemporary, be careful. They're just really weird over there. And I came back and go, no, you guys are the weird people. I was kind of like, oh my God, there's my people over there. Well, that wasn't where I was working. I was in the main building because they were doing the cute department and they wanted to make funnier stuff in it. Well, I had an editor who had no sense of humor. So uh, one strike against you right there. And not even knowing why I should be a writer in this company. And it came about six months and McCloskey, the boss, you know, he, he, he says, well, let's, you know, let's have a meeting. And he goes, I can, you seem to be struggling a little bit. He goes, we're thinking we may make you an editor. And I thought, oh, that's a perfect sign of you're not writing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you edit, which also doesn't make any sense either. If you're not a good writer, why would you be a good editor? But it was one. And I told him, honestly, at the time, I said, really, you should just fire me. I mean, I'm not having fun. I just, I really don't know what's going on. He goes, well, let me, let me think about it for a little bit. And uh, he, it, it was a week later, he goes, we're moving you over to Contemporary with all the nuts. And it changed, you talk about, like you said, change your life. I go over and there were two people over there that saved me. Uh, the first one was Gordon McKenzie. And Gordon, actually, he passed 10 years ago, but he wrote a book, Orbiting the Hairball. And I don't know if you've heard it, but I recommend that book. Is that it's, it's still on Amazon or whatever, about how to survive in a big company as a creative person. In fact, and, and Gordon walked the walk. I mean, he, uh, when he was getting higher and they didn't know what to do with him as a manager, they said, well, uh, you know, you don't really fit in the management thing. What would you like? And he, uh, he got the title uh, Creative Paradox, to which we all absolutely loved. And the, the managers were scratching their head, but because the upper management really liked what he was saying, and it was uh, is that he, he got that. And I remember going over and Gordon telling me, he, he was my supervisor, and he goes, don't let the company crush you. He goes, you know, the thing is, is that your job is to get around the red tape and find out who, who you are, I mean, and what you do well. He says, find out what you can do well, and, and then it will, it will work out 
know where you're going on. Well, at the same time, my good friend, Ed Wallerstein, who I just met there, who was a mentor at the time, he actually became my boss after a while, which was good because uh, I was really kind of the one who wanted to sit on the sidelines and go, no, you, that's wrong. You sting. Come on. This is the way to do it. And I thought, Ed understood the game. I, you know, first of all, yeah, good managerial uh, uh, pers personnel there. But Ed really understood the game. And he goes, when I started off, he goes, you're trying too hard. He says, what you want to do is he says, don't try to write the perfect joke. Just do a lot of writing. He says, if you do a lot of writing, like practice, you just get better. But he says, it also gives you a chance to start seeing what's working and what's not working. And he goes, uh, then after that, he goes, if you write one good idea that's a bestseller, you've paid for your year salary. And that just took all the pressure. I mean, it was like, okay. It became where the job wasn't over one, the job. And I don't want to say fun, but it came challenging. It's like, hey, you know what? Maybe I can, maybe I can figure this out. And it really helped being with the people that were just, like I said, laughed every day. These guys were just nuts, but it was really fun to be in that environment. And that's what I tell people you get into about finding the good people. And I think you found that at Disney. You made friends with some people out there and probably are still in contact with a few of them. And you know that they're out there. You know, you're not alone that those, you know, crazy people sort of exist somewhere. And, and really, that's how I survive. The other way to survive, we go back to the film, is that I, I thought I'm... Uh, I, you go crazy just doing little characters with their finger up in the air going hi happy birthday and it's just like ah, I gotta and I would do drawing and and ceramics and stuff on the outside but I thought well let me try I'll do a film and it was like yeah how hard can that be so 14 years later I finished it up but it is the most challenging but most rewarding thing that I'd ever done at, at the place and now you've got a dinosaur coloring book out. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I'm working well. And you get in, like I said, you get to know the people, uh, the good people. As at Scott Emmons, I collaborated on a Dinosaur Day. And Scott was easily the best humor verse writer we had at Hallmark. I mean, he just was amazing. And so he had done, gone to do Storybots and was a writer on Storybots. They'd get, well, then Storybots then was you know put on hiatus for a little bit and so he was looking to do some books and we kind of went through them and he says well you know would you be interested in some of them and I, I and I went through and I thought the dinosaurs he just all he had was it was a dinosaur coloring book and and but kind of a story to it also and I said well Scott you you know you do such great verse I'd be glad to go in and try to see what I can do with dinosaurs and then as you kind of clarify, I thought, oh, it's interesting that nobody really knows what dinosaurs look like, you know, and I love when kids draw dinosaurs because I'm going to think nobody really knows for sure what it is. In fact, just recently they found out how more dinosaurs had feathers, but kids knew that years ago. It's like, oh yeah, feathers on dinosaurs. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we'll then do the spots and stuff like that. Because when I was doing the sketching for it, I thought, boy, do I, you know, how much do I lead them? I mean, do do I have to put like maybe, you know, circles and stuff within it or, you know, designs? And I thought, no, we'll, I, we did some sketches and sent them to the kids to see what they did. And they were just great. They would, you know, put stars on them, you know, and stuff like that. And I thought, that's really good, which then got me excited about it. So we went back and finished up. And Scott just did a great job of, of setting up situations. The other thing I get into is that you have some writers that are just so good that it just brings images to your head right away. And I'm sure you probably find that music too, where it's like, oh, that hits me. I mean, that situation, I can, I can, you know, do that. And uh, it was one where we just started going through the characters and I thought, boy, it was really fun. And now the fun part is, is that we see, we ask people to send in the, the, the drawings that they've done. And I tell you, it's it's fun to be collaborating with kids you've never met <laughs> and how different it is. And you go, boy, it just brings a whole different view of what 
the dinosaurs were. So uh, Scott and I are now working together on one about landing, a children's book about landing on the moon. And uh, we were thinking about Mars and where you get into the research and how you find out about where do we go with it. I, and so it was one where I said, well, you know, we, we talked about Mars because this is the big thing now, you know, that, uh, you know, going to Mars, I thought, well, that'll be interesting. So we happened to be down, I was down in NASA or, or down in Florida, see my mom. And I thought, you know, I'll just go by NASA and, and see it and talk to them. And it's that same passion that the pe workers have there is that they're so excited now because they are now getting funding. You know, they're looking now to the future of, do we put people on Mars and, and just getting, and so I would talk to him. I said, well, we're thinking about doing a book about Mars and, and stuff. And, and I, a few of them said, what stuck with me, they said, well, I think you're getting too far ahead of yourself. Is that that's so far off in the distance and we don't know what we're going to do. The great thing about NASA, when I went through and just saw all the displays, stuff like that, it's basically a recruiting area for kids. Because it was so neat to see the kids, they had them in astronauts or stuff like that, but it was more of just talking to them as human beings and going, you know, we don't really know how we're going to get there. You are the ones that are going to figure that out. And I thought, what a great way of going at that. And so I was talking to the people, they said, you know, you might want to start with the moon because we have to do four things before we can get to Mars. One's the space station, which we've done. One, we have to land on uh, uh, the uh, like a meteor just to find about the materials. And what we will do is that finding out if you can live on the moon. So, so it was one that we thought, okay, back to the drawing board, but that's where we are right now. That sounds really fantastic. And the current uh, book, Dinosaur Day, is out from Brainy Tops Press and yes. I and your future books, of course, forthcoming. Yes, and and look it up because Scott's done some terrific books. I, I think they'd really like it. So excellent. Before we go, because I'd love to have you back on the show to talk more in depth. But before we go, what is one of your favorite parts about the creative process? You know, I I don't think of it as the creative pro. I, you know, the creative process. I just think of it as problem solving. I've always said creativity is problem solving. It just depends on what you're doing at the time or what you're, because I get into it as an everyday thing. A, a, a car mechanic is creative. I mean, it's just one of that. How do you do that? The hard part is, is just starting off. What am I going to do? Because then you have no boundaries. But then when you decide what you're going to do, suddenly you have boundaries, which is good because you work within that. But it's one that uh, uh, I remember Charles Schultz saying, he goes, you know, people ask me if I get writer's block. And he goes, you know, a plumber doesn't get writer's block. He says, that's, you know, a plumber doesn't get your house go, no, nah, I just, I can't, I can't do it today. And he goes, that's what you do. He has a strip sitting in front of him every day. And he goes, okay, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get it done. And so he just finds different ways of doing it. I love that. Any parting words for our listeners? You know, you had said, I think one of them was, as you've asked before, what's a creative, you know, how do you live a creative life? And I get into the thing is just be a good person. Uh, another book I recommend is uh, How to Be Perfect by Michael Schur. And he did Parks and Rec and uh, The Good Place. But he's a humor writer. And I thought that caught my attention. And, and it's all about philosophy and ethics. Mm. And it was really good coming out. And he goes, he's studied, he goes, I got into it late, but he studied it. And what I love about the book is that he, his footnotes are funny. I mean, if you have a book where your footnotes are funny, you can't go wrong. And he says, it just kind of, and I thought the best thing about that, because humor makes you look at things differently. So he would just do the thought process as it going on. And one of the, one of the best things is that the, the, tr the trolley question is that basically if you're on a trolley and it goes, uh, you're going to hit five people and kill them, but you have a switch that you can only kill one person. Is it, what would you do? And he goes, naturally, everybody goes to the, the one, but he goes, you go through all the things and realize how each one of them is wrong. And, and, Basically, his book is that it's hard to be a good person, but shouldn't you try? Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's basically what I believe. It's just, you know, what goes around comes around. And and if you help others, they'll help you. So that's an excellent 
Excellent sentiment to end on. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Listeners, please check the show notes for Jeff's website and links to purchase his book. And as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? Stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for Creative Piecemeal Podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.